I said, for every modulation, we want to know three things. We want to know how to modulate, what is the spectral footprint of the signal once being modulated, and the third thing is how you demodulate. So far, we actually talked only about the middle part. We discovered how, if you, take, if you have a signal M of T that occupies 0 to W at the base band, what does the uh, pass band bandwidth of the signal look like? And we derive that it's 2 times 1 plus beta times W. Now, what I'm going to do today in this lecture is talk about how do you actually modulate, how do you get the FM signal, and uh, some idea how you demodulate the FM signal. And uh, you would find out that uh, uh, one of the beautiful things about FM modulated signal is that it can be demodulated very, very easily. And that's why it gained tremendous popularity in the radio broadcasting, because you can build simple receivers that can demodulate the signal and cost close to nothing. So and as a matter of fact, you will see that the way how you demodulate is very close to the double side and AM. So you can use a receiver of a similar architecture for both AM and FM. But first thing first, let's uh, talk about FM modulation. How do you actually create an FM signal? Now, if you, if this is a little bit, uh, I guess, bad uh, writing here, because there is modulation here, or right? frequency modulation, modulation, right? but uh, we're so, uh, so kind of accustomed to treat this FM as one signal. So this FM signal, how do you perform the modulation of it? So there are two ways how you can do that, two ways. First one, we're going to call narrow band FM, and it's going to be modulated using what is called direct method. And we're going to get narrow band FM, which uh, is, means that beta is small. So for small modulation indices, you can actually generate the FM through what is called direct method or, or uh, direct modulation. For the cases where beta is large, we're going to have something that's called indirect method. And this is going to be for wide band, i.e. when beta is large. You saw that the bandwidth is directly proportional to beta, so if the beta is small, the bandwidth is small, and, and vice versa. So take a, let's take a look at first a direct method. First thing um, that you realize is FM signal is some sort of voltage or current, but even if it's current, it's still a voltage, just put the resistance. So the way how we uh, implement direct method is to something that's called voltage control oscillator, VCO. You might have heard. So direct method uh, is performed using voltage control oscillator. Oscillator is uh, just an electronic circuit that is used to generate sinusoidals. And voltage control is, means that you apply a voltage on a certain port of that circuit. And as a result of, uh, depending on what is the applied voltage, the frequency of oscillation for that, for that oscillator will change. And we're going to go through a simple example of, of such circuit. So in this, in this circuit, I guess the frequency oscillation is controlled uh, through externally applied voltage.
and what we're going to make is we're going to make our message signal be that voltage. So I'm going to use a simple example here. It's going to be use of what is called product or diet. This diode is, is usually used, most of the diodes are used in a, in a forward polarization. This one is always used in the reverse polarization. And what we actually use here is the capacitance of the PN junction. Right? So you can think of this diode as a variable capacitor whose capacitance is controlled by externally applied voltage. So how does the element of the circuit look like that would do this. You're going to have this diode, this is the symbol for it, uh, externally applied to, R, to LC resonance circuit. So this would be some sort of, uh, put in some sort of positive feedback. So this is L0, this is C0, and this goes to some amplifying whatever it is over there that makes things oscillate. This is my message signal, M of T. And this here has uh, some capacitance uh, that's proportional to M of T. So if you look at this now uh, LC resonance circuit, you have this equivalent capacitance. This is C equivalent. That depends on, on this message signal, M of T. So to make this. Uh, Mathematically, so you have C equivalent is C0 plus some constant times M of T. The equivalent capacitance depends on message signal. frequency for this circuit? What is the resonant frequency for LC circuit? 1 over, one over 2 pi square root of LC. So the resonant frequency here, F I of T, is going to be 1 over 2 pi times L0 times C equivalent, because now this equivalent is the total capacity. So the resonant frequency will change as a function of the applied voltage M of T, because the Y, because the, the equivalent capacitance changed. So let's uh, uh, do some little manipulation here to put this into a format that we desire. So I can write this as 1 over 2 pi square root of L0, C0, 1 plus K over C0, M of T. Right, so what did I do? Instead of C equivalent, I wrote C0 plus K M of T, and then I took C0 outside. Go ahead. No, well, I thought you had a question. Okay. So this can be written as 1 over 2 pi square root of L0 C0 times 1 over square root of 1 plus K over C0 M of T. Now this here is the, the frequency when M of T does not exist, right? So that's the resonant frequency of the carrier. And this part here modulates that resonant frequency. Now if we use identity for small x, um, 1 over square root of 1 plus x is approximately equal to 1. What's the first order approximation of this? Use Taylor series. <laughs> Anybody? Uh, it's uh, 1 minus x over 2 plus over x. One of the, uh, look at your calculus book, but, but essentially, what, what you're doing here is you're decomposing this into a Taylor series and then keeping just the first two 
terms of the thickness. How about, uh, uh, how about uh, 1 over 1 plus x? One, one, one minus, minus x, x. Yeah. plus all x. How about uh, uh, what else can we do? Well, let's keep it like this. Let's let's say how about this one? Square root of one plus x. One one plus x over two. two. Excellent. So these are all very useful approximations that uh, we, we derive from the table series. So now, if I take the first one here and uh, I apply it to this expression here, I get that my instantaneous oscillations are going to be this f0, 1 plus k over c0 times m of t, approximately, right? For small k c0 t. Right, so if my modulation index is is uh, small, then this is what it becomes. And you can see now that your instantaneous uh, uh, frequency f i of t is equal to f zero one plus some alpha t. So it depends linearly on m of t, which is what we try to accomplish. Go ahead. Um, um, I I couldn't see what you were talking about when you said that two pi square root of square root of the capacitance times inductance is. Uh -huh. You have that little thing there. I I, I totally missed it. What, what what is this? What did I I forgot to put the comment. This is a resonant frequency k. Okay. Okay. If m of t is equal to zero, then this part goes away, right? So if it, there is not, there's no modulation, your resonance circuit is oscillating in this. Once there is a modulation, then this part kicks in. And if that modulation happens to be small, then you see that the output frequency is the linearly proportional to your message signal, which is, which is how uh, we, we obtain FM modulation. Now, this is just a simple example, right? In general, whenever you can, this is what we're shooting for, right? To get this, right? So we can do that in a various configurations using various elements, various re resonance circuits, you know, uh, where you can use transistors and so on. But the idea is simple. You put your message signal, it changes the resonant frequency of some circuit, and then as a result of that, uh, what you get to the output is the cosine that varies its frequency in the proportion to the message signal. Now most of the time to get this you use nonlinear devices like these diodes and so on. And because of that you have to restrict yourself to relatively small variations around the operating point. Because if you start to uh, try to vary, vary over large uh, uh, bandwidth around the operating point around your, around your resonant frequency, you cannot maintain the linearity of this relationship. The, the other terms start uh, cropping up, right? So that's a, a direct method. Let's take a look at indirect. Now, indirect method has two steps, right? The, the first, this one is in one shot. Indirect method has two steps. First one is direct method. So first, in the indirect method, first you generate the narrow band FM, and then you send that narrow band FM to something that's called frequency multiplier that makes this FM broad. So the part, the second step is frequency multiplication. So, I guess starting point here's uh, U of T, that's uh, AC cosine 2 pi FCT plus this phi of T. That's the, that's the 
uh, angle modulated signal in general, we're going to have this phi of t proport somehow dependent on m of t. If uh, we have fm, then phi of t is uh, 2 pi kf integral from minus infinity to t m of tau d tau. Right? So that's f from t phi of t. So that's the part of the message signal that is made dependent on m of tau. The k is relatively small because we obtain this through the narrow band fm. So the beta is small in this case. Now the question is, uh, how do we actually, now knowing that this is small, how can we generate yet another way how we can generate the uh, narrow band that can go ahead? Yeah, well, are we using the same type of circuit setup? Yeah, that, that would be, that's an idea, right? Idea how we get it, right? You can, this is what we're trying to achieve. But however you get there, it's fine, right? I'm saying the easiest way to get direct method is through voltage control oscilloscopies, right? But here I'm saying, okay, well, is there any other ways of doing it? I know in the in the indirect method I have to generate narrow band FM first. So what I'm going to do is here, knowing that this is now narrow band FM, suggest an alternative method. Either one can be used. Uh, this one is the best for me as a, as a I guess presenter of this to illustrate because it carries the ID. The second one is kind of fudgy, right? You will see that you, you, you're going to get similar result, but uh, not, not uh, arriving at this thing here, but without relying on that idea over there. So all I know is that this phi of t is small. Uh, Kf is small. It's a narrow band Fm. I'm not, my beta is small in this case. So if uh, phi of t is small, then u of t, or this is in general, u of t can be written as ac cosine 2 pi fct times cosine phi of t minus ac sine 2 pi fct times sine phi of t. Right? What did I do? I took this cosine of the sum of the two angles and I wrote it as in expanded form as a cosine alpha, cosine beta minus sine, sine alpha, sine beta. Now, let's add two more to this list here. If x is small, what is cosine of x approximately? For small x. sine of x? It's x plus small of x. For small x, sine of x is equal to x. For small x, cosine goes to 1. Now where is all of this coming from? How am I pulling all of this? Let me just, let me just illustrate this. And this uh, may distract us a little bit here, but let me uh, let me add one more here. e to the x is approximately what? One. One. Right. So let's say this. Uh, e to the x. What is e to the x? It's 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 plus x 3 over 3 factorial plus x to the n over n factorial plus and so on, right? You know that one, right? What, what is it that I put here? This is called what? It's called Maclaurin series for e to the x. It's, uh, it's uh, how we actually define e to the x. Now let's put this one here, e to the jx, right? Let's substitute e to the jx into this one. That's how we're going to find out what is e to the jx. Right? So if I put this here, this becomes 1 plus jx minus x squared over 2 minus j x cubed over 3 plus what? x4 over 4 factorial 
plus j x five or five factorial, and so on. Right? How did I how did I do that? Well, I put <coughs> the x and I use you know what I know about j. J squared is minus one. J cubed is minus j. J to the fourth is one, and then it kind of starts going all over again. Now, if I group my uh, real and imaginary part, this becomes one minus x squared over two plus x fourth over four factorial minus x six over six factorial and so on. And then plus j x minus x cubed over three factorial plus x five over five factorial minus and so on. Now, who recognizes this? What is that? Cosine. This is cosine of x. And this thing here is sine of x. So that's the proof of that e to the jx, where it's coming from. But from here, you can see, for small x, you know, the dominant part is this, right? For small x in cosine, the dominant part is 1. For small x in sine, the dominant part is x. They're just keeping the first term of this, of this series, right? So that's where these approximations are coming from. Okay. Go ahead. When you talk about small x, you're talking about a value beneath 1, like? Way closer. Like very, very, very close. To very, the closer to 0, the closer this approximation becomes to the true value. Because all of these other terms go to zero much faster than this dominant term, right? If you look at these things here, for small x, these guys are very, very small. Anyway, right? So, so then it really becomes close to x, okay? So now, if we use this and we realize that phi of t is small, since phi of t is small, then u of t is approximately ac. How about cosine of phi of t? Approximately 1, right? Because phi of t is small. So this is ac cosine 2 pi fct minus ac times phi of t times sine 2 pi fct where I've used the fact that for small phi of t, I can take the sine of phi of t and replace that with phi of, phi of t. Okay? Now, that uh, gives me a, a really easy block diagram here that I can use for narrow band fn generation. something like this, m of t, and then I can really do one of the two things. I can take and integrate that, and, or I can just let the signal go through on its own. If I integrate the signal, then I'm having a fm modulator. If I just let the signal go through, I have a pm modulator. This is just my phi of t at this point, whatever it is that uh, I want to select. Now. I select one of the two, and then I form, I have an oscillator here, and I have a phase shift of uh, plus pi over two. Let's say the oscillator is AC sine two pi FCT. When I shift the sine for uh, pi over two, I get here AC cosine two pi FCT. 
and uh, I mul multiply my incoming signal here with AC sine, and then I'm going to add cosine to this subtract the sine the cosine, and then I get here, to, this is my narrow band. FM or PM, depending whether I turn. Okay. So now what you can see is I'm actually implementing this using just nothing but linear, linear devices here. I have oscillators, some phase shifters, multipliers. Well, multiplier is not linear, but but uh, you can implement this narrow band FM using this block diagram here. You don't have to have Varactor diodes and so on. But in order to do to explain this, you know, the idea that we discussed just a second ago is, is very useful. Okay, so this is how I get narrow band FM. So that's the first first part. The second step is the frequency multiplication. The way how we, uh, uh, I guess, in the second step is we're going to take that narrow band FM. So this is narrow band modulator. And then we're going to put that to a long diagram, frequency by N. And I'll talk about how you implement this. And then you're going to uh, translate this to whatever is the carrier frequency and then you're going to filter that using the uh, transmission filter with a, with a proper name. So let's call this x of t and let's call this y of t and then uh, this is obviously my u of t. Okay, so let's talk about how does this work. x of t this is M of T coming in. X of T is narrow band modulated signal. So X of T is going to be AC cosine 2 pi FCT plus phi of T. The important part here is that phi of T is small. Right? So however I create it, I can create it this way or I can create it using the voltage control oscillator. But this is a narrow band FM. Narrow band FM or PM, which means phi of T is small. Now, after frequency multiplication, this Y of T becomes AC cosine 2 pi. Uh, let's instead of FC here, let me put F intermediate, FI some different frequency, because that's not going to be the carrier frequency. It's going to be something lower than the carrier frequency. So after frequency multiplication, you end up N Fi T plus N Phi of T. So you can see that this shifts the carrier frequency, but also multiplies the uh, Phi of T, makes the Phi of T large. So this is going to be your frequency after frequency multiplier. And then uh, this uh, U of T is going to be translated version because this is nothing but moving this signal to the frequency of the, of the transmission. So this U of T becomes AC cosine 2 pi F local oscillator plus N F I T plus N I of T. This here now becomes your C, your carrier frequency. So this is just a translation. Now the question is, uh, I don't have it here, but let me spend a couple of seconds just, uh, just explaining how do you actually uh, generate frequency multiply. I 
Then E out or F of X can be written as let's say constant plus A one X plus A two X squared plus and so on, right? It has all of these terms. Okay? Now when I put in this sinusoidal here, so let's say F of E in is gonna be that's your E out is going to be some constant plus a1 e in of t plus a2 e in squared of t plus so on. Now imagine that e in of t is sinusoid. When you, when you, this is just a constant output, this is a linear term. If this has a, a frequency of f0, what's the frequency of this one? Let's say E in example. E in is cosine 2 pi f 0. <coughs> then E out is going to be a 0 plus A1 cosine 2 pi f 0 plus A2 cosine squared 2 pi f 0 plus A3 cosine q 2 pi and 0 t and so on, right? This is just saying that any nonlinear function can be given in this form. Therefore, if I feed it a sinusoidal, this is what I get at the end. Now, if the frequency of the input sinusoidal is f0, I get this term here. This term is yet another sinusoidal at the output with the same frequency. So this one is just an amplifier. If, if I look at this one, this will give me two frequencies. It will give me a DC component, and it, it's going to give me twice the frequency of the input signal. Right? This one here is going to give me, again, uh, F0 and 3 F0. Right? So every one of these terms is going to give me an additional frequency components. Right? So now, if I look at this, and I assume that the spectrum of the input signal so I'm just going to drive uh, draw one sided Let's say this is my input signal, E in of F, and it has the frequency at 0. This is F. Then the output signal will look somewhat like this. It will have something at DC, something at F0, something at 2 F0, 3 F0, and so on. Right? 0, F0, 2 F0, 3 F0. So if I filter, for example, just this, then I end up with a frequency double, right? Because it will double my frequency, right? Uh, I'm going to lose some in magnitude, right? But magnitude I can always bring back to proper amplitude. 
communication. The, the thing here that I'm shooting for is the translation in the frequency domain. So by running your signal through a non-linearity, what you're actually doing is you're generating all of these components around the integer multiple of the fundamental frequency of your signal. This is how you get uh, frequency multiplication. It's some non-linearity followed by appropriate filtering to pick up the multiple of frequency that you care about. And the idea here is simple. You, you start with a narrow band FM, and then you multiply, you run this through a non-linearity, and then pick the end harmonic. This translates the spectrum of the signal to the end harmonic, but also increase the bandwidth of the modulated signal by multiplying this phi of t here by n. Right? So it's kind of now a matter of design, you know, how how you pick those parameters. And I'm sure when we get to the uh, review lecture, we're going to go through some examples that show you how you actually do this. Uh, couple questions. Uh, um, what is the, the FLO and F? T, is that right? F I. F I. F I. Right. Because, because you're doing here frequency multiplication, right, you don't want uh, to modulate the F C carrier here. Because F I. You don't want this to be F C. Why? Because, or this one, you don't want it to be F C. Because when you run it through the frequency multiplier, it will multiply it n times. So you want this last one to be F C. So let's say, let's say you want, let me give you some numbers. Let's say your FI is 100 kilohertz, right? So you take your signal and you modulate 100 kilohertz K, right? And then you run this through a 10 times uh, frequency multiplier. So if N is equal to 10, you end up with a, a FI times N being 10,000 kilohertz, one megahertz, right? Mm -hmm. So after frequency multiplication, you get it one megahertz. But maybe you need to transmit at uh, 934.3 megahertz. So <coughs> let's say, I don't know, 150 uh, megahertz, right? So what you need to do is you need to take this whole signal and translate it to that frequency. And you do that by, by multiplying this with this local velocity. So that you get FC is going to be equal to N times FI plus this FLO, right? So from here, FLO is going to be whatever is the transmit frequency minus N times FI, right? So if I want to transmit, let's say, 1,500 kilohertz, then my local oscillator is going to be 500 kilohertz, right? So when you sum that with a, with a, uh, uh, and if I end up with the, the proper case and right. The other question is, what type of filter are you using? This is a, this is a transmission filter that has a bandwidth equal to two times one plus beta times w, right? Uh -huh. That's the filter that picks picks a proper a proper signal, right? Because the uh, FM modulation is inherently nonlinear. You're going to get all of these parasitic components everywhere. And you cannot be corrupting adjacent bands. So what happens is, and that's true not only with FM, it's true with every transmission. The last stage of when you transmit some, uh, you know, is going to be a band pass filter that claims your band, right, and rejects everything outside. So that all of these spurious modulation components are being rejected. Right? So in, in this case, you know, you, you're running this signal through some non-linearity. So you're getting not only the <coughs> fundamentally in the stuff that you care about, but you're getting these components, right? And F0, 3, F0, 5, F0, 7, F0, and so on, right? And they are undesirable components because they are falling within the bandwidth that's not allocated for your service. Let's say you're operating FM radio station. The signal that you generate has the components that overlap with other FM radio stations. And you cannot be transmitting that. So you say, okay, I'm going to filter only the portion of the band where my signals are supposed to exist and reject everything else. Okay? So that's uh, FM modulation. So there are two, two types. One is the direct one. We, can, we have two shown 
two log diagrams. One is through the voltage control oscillator, and one is using that linear circuit, this guy here, where you know approximately both of them give you the narrow band FM. Key here is that the modulation in this is small, therefore the approximations for small something whole, right? That's that's uh, what we what we derive. And then the second one was uh, wide band FM. This one is generated using indirect method, where in the step one you generate the narrow band FM, and then through frequency amplification, you have frequency uh, multiplication, you actually end up with a wide band FM signal that you transport. The last thing that we need to cover is, so that's the, the transmit end. We already talked about the bandwidth, and the last thing that we need to talk about is how you actually demodulate FMC. So demodulation. There are two, two uh, approaches here. One is you demodulate by taking an FM signal, turning it into AM, and then use analog detector. And the second one is use phase lock loops. PLLs, phase locked loops. Okay. So in the first method, we take the FM signal, we make it an AM, and then we feed that to the envelope detector. If you remember, envelope detector, we liked it a lot because it was a very simple device. It is asynchronous; doesn't have to have. You don't have to extract any frequency of the carrier. And it costs practically nothing, right? So what we devise is methodology that takes an FM signal, makes it an AM at the receiver, and then demodulates that signal. The second approach is using uh, something that's called phase lock loops. The theory and practice of PLLs is quite complex. I'm not going to go into here. If you end up in this area, you're going to uh, study phase lock loops. Uh, but it, it's kind of beyond uh, the scope. I used to teach it as a part of this course, but now I skip it because it's, it's way complicated for one lecture that I have to allocate for it. So I'd rather just skip it. Be aware there is exists and, and you run into this term quite a bit, but uh, I guess the, just to explain it, you need more than one lecture that we cannot dedicate in this class. So, but the first one is really easy to understand. And uh, even though it's not extremely, uh, uh, I guess its performance is not extremely good, it is quite uh, illustrative when it comes to thinking, right? So let's go over that one and understand how, how it works. So the first one, demodulation. FM into AM. Now, this one has two steps. Step one is convert <coughs> FM signal into double sideband large kit. And this is done using through a device or through a block, <coughs> block or discriminator. Okay? So we're going to have the first device that's going to be discriminator. The, what is the purpose of that device? It's going to take an FM signal and make it an AM signal. And then a step two 
is going to be uh, demodulate double side band large carrier uh, by using envelope detector. And you saw the last last time when we talked about AM, the envelope detector is a really, really simple demodulator and uh, you know if we can use it that uh, it's highly beneficial because it's very, very cheap. So let's take a look at step one. What is a discriminant? Well, what does discriminate discriminator needs to do? It needs to convert an FM modulated signal uh, into an amplitude modulated signal. So how do you do that? Well, I need a device that will take an instantaneous frequency and make the amplitude of the signal dependent on instantaneous frequency. Because my instantaneous frequency is what FM, what uh, is dependent on my message signal in FM. In FM, the message signal is proportional to the instantaneous frequency. So if I make my amplitude proportional to the instantaneous frequency, then I've made my amplitude proportional to the message signal, which is double sideband, double sideband large carrier. So now, so this is a filter essentially with frequency response. that changes linearly with frequency. Now, how does this filter, well, it has a frequency response A of F that's equal to some constant plus K F minus F C for F minus FC smaller than the bandwidth of your signal. So let me just uh, draw that so that it becomes clear. This is the frequency axis. This is the carrier frequency. This is the bandwidth of your signal. And I need something that has a linear dependency as a function of, of frequency over this particular band. So that means age of F is going to look somewhat like this. That's the, that's the filter. Now, it may look, OK, how do I get something that changes linearly like this frequency? Imagine, think of, always remember, everything, this is engineered. It doesn't have to be completely linear. It just needs to be close to linear, right? What I don't show here, in a, in a regular, and what I don't care in a regular operation is how this continues. Now, if I continue it like this, then you can see that this can be made, right? I'm just using, this is, for example, a band pass filter for which I'm not using the pass band. I'm using the skirts of the filter to get the response that is, that is approximately linear, linear function of the frequency. So in this range, that is the range where my FM signal exists, the filter has this kind of frequency response. So, so let me call, call this a linear part. And this is not the important part, right? It can be any way you want. It can be anything, anything it uh, ends up being. So now that I have, that this is my uh, frequency response, let's uh, apply my uh, FM signal to this and see what comes as the output. like there's nowhere we can go now, so. <laughs> 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 so. Uh, 
so we might as well. We're gonna get the next lecture. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if there's any place on earth where it rains like in Florida. <laughs> it's like you fell into the pool. But it lasts for a short time. All right, so let's uh, let's look at. So I have my frequency response. That is a linear function of frequency, so it's on v zero at the frequency f equal to f zero, and it is uh, what do I have here? K, right? K plus k some constant, which is the slope of your discriminator, f minus f c, where f c is the frequency of the chain. So f c frequency. Okay. Now, how does my modulated signal look like? Well, consider U F M of T. It has some magnitude A C cosine. Here's your carrier frequency, and then plus two by K F integral from minus infinity to t m of tau v tau. So that's a general form of my FM modulated signal. I'm going to feed this signal into a filter that has this age of f. So there will be a filter with age of f where I'm going to put down UFM of t and I'm going to be expecting some signal u output of t and my quest here is to determine what, how does this output signal look like if my frequency response looks like this. Notice, you know, and I promised you that a few lectures ago, uh, how often we switch between time and frequency domain, right? This is the specification of this filter in the frequency domain. This is specification of the signal in the time, domain, right? So, you know, we go back and forth just looking at whichever one is more insightful even to what we're trying to achieve. Now, how does this, what is the instantaneous frequency here? It's 1 over 2 pi d over dt, all the instantaneous phase. But what is the instantaneous phase here? Whatever I have under the cosine, right? That's the instantaneous angle, instantaneous phase. So the instantaneous frequency here is Fc plus Kf times m of t. Do you all see that? 1 over 2 pi and 2 pi cancel here and here. The relative of Fct with respect to t is just Fc. The relative of Kf times this integral with respect to t is Kf times m of t. So that's my instantaneous frequency. Did you follow? Yeah. Yeah, we, we did that a uh, few lectures ago as well. So now this is my instantaneous frequency. The, the magnitude of the signal at the output, this is the uh, frequency magnitude response, right? So the magnitude is going to depend on the frequency, on the, on the instantaneous frequency. So I can write my U output of T as AC, then the magnitude is going to be this, but for f equal to the instantaneous frequency. So it's going to be equal to v0 plus k. Instead of f, I can write f instantaneous. So it's going to be fc plus kf m of t minus fc. So this becomes the magnitude of the signal. This, this, uh, uh, the, Filter is linear, so it cannot change the frequency. The frequency stays the same. So I have here cosine of 2 pi fct plus 2 pi kf integral from minus infinity to t m of tau to d tau. So this is what comes out of this filter. Okay? The magnitude here is proportional to instantaneous frequency. The phase, the phase and frequency cannot change. Why? Because filter is a linear device. 
in linear device, if you feed the sinusoidal over frequency f, you get sinusoidal over frequency f back. So now fc and fc cancels, and you get u of 0 of t is equal to ac, v0 plus k times kf times m of t times cosine 2 pi fc t plus 2 pi kf dk of the minus infinity t m of tau tau. Now, let me rewrite this one more time. I can say u of 0 of t is equal to ac times v0, 1 plus a, m normalizes, <coughs> times cosine 2 pi fct plus 2 pi kf integral from minus infinity to t m of tau d tau. All right. Where this uh, a is equal to k times kf over v0. You can see if I take v0 outside, I end up with that. So what kind of signal is this? Well, it's it's a mixture, right? It's not really pure. It has two, two parts. It has this part, which you recognize as being a part of double side and large k, right? And it has this part here, which is still FM modulated. <coughs> but <coughs> think about this uh, from the practical standpoint. FC is very hot. Let's say FC is 1 megahertz, or some carrier frequency even higher than that. The bandwidth of this signal is, is very small relative to the carrier frequency. If you look at AM broadcasting, you can be, let's say, 1 megahertz of the carrier frequency and only 10 kilohertz of the band. So if you zoom out and look at this sinusoidal, even though it's modulated, it's very much pure sinusoidal, especially if you feed it to the envelope detector, right? Envelope detector just goes and interpolates the crests of the sinusoidal. So if I present this signal to uh, presenting U output of T to envelope detector so you have U output of T into something that we envelope detector and we saw last time what is envelope detector it's a rectifier followed by the low pass filter right so it takes these negative parts of the sinusoidal, split them over, and then it kind of goes on top of the, all these crests of the sinusoidals, and, and you accomplish that through the, through the uh, low pass filter. And then I put here a DC blocking circuit, let's, I get the signal Y of T. Well, what is, let's call this signal here Z of T. What is Z of T? Z of t is going to be the envelope of this signal. Well, what is the envelope of this signal? This part. This here gets uh, ironed out uh, from the uh, envelope detector. So Z of t is AC V0 1 plus A MN of t. And you can see that this signal has two components. It has this DC component and has this component proportional to MN of t. The DC component does not go through this DC blocking circuit. So you get your Y of T equal to AC V0 times A times MN of T, which is proportional <coughs> to the N of T. So that's how we do the demodulation here. So the first step is you take this input signal, which is only modulated in frequency here, you run it to a a filter that has a frequency response that depends linearly uh, with frequency around the carrier frequency. And what happens is, as a result, you end, up this, you end up with a signal that has two parts. It has still the original FM modulated part, but it also has now the magnitude that linearly depends on the M of T. 
And then you take the signal, you put it in the envelope detector to get rid of this part. Just keep the envelope, keep the magnitude dependency, and then you block the DC component and you end up with something that is, that is really an T. And then if you think about it, this is exactly the same process or from this point on that you use in the AM receiver, right? The AM receiver, you take your modulated signal, you feed it into envelope detector and then block the DC. Well, in FM signal, before you do, the, before you pass the signal to the envelope detector, you have to actually run it through this discriminating filter here. And you remember all the radios, they have that switch, AM, FM switch. Mm -hmm. When you put that FM in there, what it does, it includes this filter in a, in a chain, right? It, 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 uh, 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 it passes the thing, signal through the discriminator before envelope detector. In AM case, you just pass the signal straight to the end of what you think. Okay, go ahead. Um, so looking at that, you have a modulated signal that comes out and it becomes demodulated and it goes through the filter, right? No, no. Well, it comes modulated here, right? You look at this is the signal. It is FM modulated. So you have the instantaneous frequency that is directly proportional to the message signal. What this filter does, it brings this modulation from within cosine and puts it on the magnitude as well. So what you have here, look, as a result of that, you end up with a signal that's kind of, if you want to say, double modulated or, or modulated with two flavors. It still retains its frequency modulation, right? You didn't change that. And filter cannot change that because the filter is a linear device. Whatever frequency you put in, that's the frequency that you get out. But what the, freak, the filter did is it changed the magnitude behavior. So the magnitude now depends on the instantaneous frequency. And now, when you put that into envelope detector because of the narrow band nature of the signal here, you know, and how high FC is relative to all the frequencies in the M of T, this envelope detector just takes the signal. I mean, instead of trying to wave my head, let me try to draw this. What, what is happening. This is now the envelope, right? As a result of after this is this part here. The fact that this one is FM modulated means this. And I'm also greatly exaggerating here. Okay. Now, what is happening? You can see that the, the frequency change changes, right? Here, it's of a much higher frequency. Here, the frequency is lower, and so on, right? So this is an FM modulated signal and AM modulated signal, right? When you put this through the envelope detector, what does envelope detector do? It actually takes this signal, looks at the envelope, and it takes kind of, this is the half of it, takes all of these negative ones and flips them over. Right, it rectifies first. So it rectifies the signal by placing placing these guys like this, right? You know, they're going to be of a different width, right? Because the signal is FM modulated. But if, uh, if you now pass this through a low pass filter, it will just kind of interpolate on the top of these crests, right? and you get your message signal back, right? So that's what, what happens, uh, you know, in the envelope detector when you present this signal to it. Now the question that is still unanswered is, how do I get this? You know, what can give me this kind of behavior, right? What can, uh, what can I use to uh, design uh, envelope, uh, to design the discriminant, how complicated that filter needs to be? And uh, let me uh, give you an example of the discriminator. And then uh, you'll be surprised how simple it is. You know, the whole uh, beauty of, or elegance of all of these is, is that you end up with all of these equations and then you put what the circuits look like. And it's just like a couple of resistors and capacitors or something. 
but we give them these big names, discriminator, envelope detector, yeah. all these fancy things. So let's say example of a discriminator. Let's look at a circuit that looks like this. R, C. I put here V in and I draw V out. One would be very, very hard pressed to find anything simpler than this circuit. Right? And uh, what is the transfer function? What is the frequency response of this circuit? Well, V out is going to be <coughs> R over R plus 1 over J omega C times V in, which uh, is J omega C R over 1 plus J omega C R. Uh, let's make, let J omega C R be much smaller than 1, then V out over V in is approximately equal to J omega C R. Or if you want to look at this, you can say differently 2 pi, uh, say, uh, R C times 2 pi F. This is a constant K times F. J K F. So if you now look at this as a filter H of F, how does the magnitude of this filter look like? This is F, and this is magnitude of F. It looks like this, right? <coughs> is this filter linear, uh, having an output that's a linear function of the frequency? Yes. As a matter of fact, this is an ideal discriminator. Why? Because it is, or at least in this approximation, because it, it has a linear behavior all across. Now, that's consequence of this approximation here. But, uh, so this filter has a response that is linear proportional to the, to the frequency. Now, let me ask you this. If I look at, look at this filter different, filter age of omega is going to be RC, that's some constant, times J omega. Now, this filter multiplies the signal with J omega and then scales it with some constant. If I multiply by J omega in a frequency domain, what is it that I'm doing in time? No? J omega multiplication in time domain, what do I do uh, in a frequency domain? What do I do in the time domain? No. No. Let me up the, the, the stakes here. Five points on mine. Let me repeat the question. Okay, here's the question. <laughs> if I'm multiplying with J omega in a frequency domain, what is it that I'm doing in time? The Add it. No. Okay, let me put that here. Uh, if uh, x of t has a Fourier transform x of f, then dx of t over dt has a Fourier transform j 2 pi f times x of f. So multiplying by j omega in a frequency domain is a differentiation in a time domain. If I divide by j omega, what is it that I'm doing in time? Okay, you knew that, right? right so, so I kind of, I like that, right? Divide by five points. Right? Is that the, the, the Laplacian? Uh, yeah, it's yeah the same thing, right? In Laplace, in Laplace transform, when you multiply by s in a in a in a frequency domain, you are differentiating in time. All right, so, so beautiful insight here. So I know if I present a signal to this, uh, to this little uh, circuit here, what comes at the output is the derivative of that signal. 
So let me present the FM signal to this. So if V in of T is equal to AC cosine 2 pi <coughs> SCT plus uh, 2 pi KF integral from minus infinity to T M of tau V tau, V out is going to be RC times D V in of T over dt, right, because that, what, what that uh, filter does is multiplies by j omega in the frequency domain, which is differentiation in the time. So when I take the derivative here, it's rc times ac, derivative of what is underneath is going to be, uh, let's say, 2 pi fc plus 2 pi kf times m of t, and then the derivative of this is going to be psi of 2 pi fct plus 2 pi kf integral from minus infinity to t and of tau. So that's what comes at the output. If I present this fm signal to the input of that circuit, this is what comes at the output of that circuit. Now, there are two parts here. There's this 2 pi RC, uh, AC, and then I have FC plus KF times MT, and then I have this sine <coughs> by FCT plus 2 pi KF times integral from minus infinity to T M of tau. D tau. You notice this is your double side band large k, right? And this part here is still FM modulated. After envelope detector, if I present this signal to the envelope detector, what comes at, uh, at the output part? Just this part, right? So after envelope detection, you get with the signal z of t, which is 2 pi r c a c f c 1 plus a times m of t, where a is equal to k f over f c. And then after dc blocking, You get your output signal y of t is 2 pi <coughs> r c a c f times a times m of t, which is proportional to m of t, which is what we tried to do in the first place. Right? So look at that circuit there. Who would have ever thought that uh, it performs such a fancy operation that is here uh, the modulation of the FM signal. So this gives you an idea for uh, you know some circuits that uh, simple circuits that can be used for FM demodulation. Let's uh, just uh, sketch them so that some simple circuits. Like for example I can use this. This is my uh, discriminator that guy from over there. Then I feed that through the envelope detector. <coughs> and then I have a DC blocking circuit. This is a diode. These are resistors in the box. So this kind of network or this kind of simple circuit can be used to demodulate that band. What's the cost of this? Nothing, right? Really, really cheap. This is your this part is a discriminator. This is a halfway rectifier. 
So this is, uh, and then no, the diode and, and is a rectifier, and this is a low pass. So this would be your envelope detector. <coughs> and this here is DC block. Right? And you can come up with a whole bunch of sort of simple circuits that kind of follow this, this <coughs> general methodology. You need something that is a linear <coughs> filter that has the fre frequency response that depends linearly on the instantaneous frequency. You have to have some sort of rectifier followed by a low pass filter, followed by a DC blocking circuit to each. What, what makes us believe that there's an DC signal in there? Because the sign itself is already DC, it's sinusoidal, right? So the DC shifts in that direction. Or <coughs> what makes it, uh, uh, you have to have a DC component because your filter uh, has, what is the DC component? The DC component is the value of your filter's frequency response at the frequency of the kit. Remember how your filtering characteristics look like? It looks like someone like this. Where this is your frequency of the carrier, and there is some response for that. That causes the DC. Okay. So there's basically some type of battery that causes some type of noise with the DC. No, 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 no. There's, there's no uh, not battery. It's, it's a, just the signal itself is going to have the DC component. That's coming from the, from the how this frequency response looks like. Remember, the frequency response was H of F was a DC value <coughs> plus some constant F minus FC. So if, uh, if your frequency happens to be the frequency of the carrier, the mm -hmm. output is going to be this constant P0. So there will be some DC, DC components to the output. All right, so let me give you some exercises for this one. This is the homework assignment eight. Exercises 415, 416, 417, 418, 419, 420, 421, and 422. There is no assignment. No. So just focus on example problems from the text, from the problems. They're all, I mean, it looks like a lot, but they're all simple one-liners, right? Very short problems. They can exercise these problems. Next time, I think we're, we're actually going to do a second problem-solving session. So I'm just going to be doing nothing but problems. Also, feel free to bring any questions you have. I'll always keep the priority to your questions then. Mm -hmm. On the first day, we'll do problems. Yeah, this Thursday. Just so all and, the next, hours. and the next week is going to no, be the first review. hour, and then I'll do some review or some material on the second. And next Tuesday, we'll have class. Next Tuesday, we uh, yeah, we have class. Right? Yeah, I mean, it's going to be a lecture or all No, next video? Tuesday, I'm going to do some review material again. Oh, okay. And more problems. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Right? Okay. Okay. And then Thursday is the different.